Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, President Biden demands an immediate ceasefire, while revelations emerge about behind the scenes White House directives undermining Israeli sovereignty. And U.S. farmers travel thousands of miles to help their Israeli counterparts bring in the crops. Plus, putting down roots in Israel, thanks to help from CBN partners. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israel is anticipating a potential major retaliation by Iran after one of its top generals was killed in a strike earlier this week. And Israel is also dealing with a major change in U.S. policy after a phone call between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu on Thursday. Take a look. Israel moved to get more aid into Gaza by opening up a key port and a crossing into northern Gaza. This comes after President Biden told Prime Minister Netanyahu that U.S. policy toward Israel will change unless the Israeli military does more to protect aid workers and deals with the humanitarian situation in Gaza. With respect to Gaza, uh, we need to see certain changes. Uh, uh, and if we don't, then we'll have to consider changes to our own policy. But it's not about, it's not about leverage. Biden also told Netanyahu he wants a ceasefire deal without delay. He underscored as well that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. And he urged Prime Minister Netanyahu to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay. But there are still big differences between Israel and Hamas, as Hamas wants the war to end immediately with a complete Israeli pullout from Gaza. So some argue a ceasefire could mean losing the war. Jeff Balaban, who leads the American Center for Law and Justice's Israel operations from Jerusalem, told CBN News a ceasefire would have dire consequences for Israel. The implications for that is that America has now completely become Israel's tactical enemy. In, in, in real terms, in practical terms, this is impossible. That is demanding that Israel lose this war. Israel cannot afford to lose this war. This is an existential war. Netanyahu also maintains Israel must win its war against terrorist forces for the sake of the U.S. and the rest of the West. This is a larger battle. Our battle is your battle. Our victory is your victory. And if, they, if we don't have a victory, this will have enormous implications for American security, for our common uh, future. So we must win. In his call with Netanyahu, Biden expressed outrage over Israel's accidentally killing of seven aid workers in Gaza on Monday. But American conservatives point out the U.S. also killed civilians with the drone strike during Biden's chaotic pullout from Afghanistan in 2021. I am now convinced that as many as 10 civilians, including up to seven children, were tragically killed in that strike. Meanwhile, Blinken is taking heat for suggesting Israel could become like Hamas if it doesn't do more to reverence life in Gaza. That's our strength. It's what distinguishes us from terrorists like Hamas. If we lose that reverence for human life, we risk becoming indistinguishable from those we confront. The latest disagreement between the White House and Israel comes as Israelis from all political viewpoints increasingly believe their country is isolated and stands alone in the world. Yet despite their political divisions, Israelis agree Hamas must be destroyed. Balaban says many in Israel are turning to God. They feel 100% resolute. There is, of course, a large, we've seen this since the beginning of the war, turning to God. We see people who say things like, I'm not sure I'm a believer, or I've never been a believer, but I'm keeping Shabbat. Or I'm not sure I'm a believer, but I'm going to say the Shema prayer, or I'm going to wear tzitzit, because that's what unifies the Jewish people. Joining me to talk more about this is Jeff Balaban with the American Center for Law and Justice. Jeff, great to be with you. Yesterday was an important day in U.S.-Israeli relations, uh, a phone call with uh, President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. From what you know about the call, what's your reaction? Uh, pain, outrage. This is, a, this is a very dark day, not just in terms of U.S.-Israel relations, but I would say relations between the United States of America and good and evil, between the United States of America and God. Mm -hmm. uh, what the Biden administration is now doing is unconscionable, and no one is pretending that it's about anything other than 
the Democrats' domestic political concerns. America is now publicly turning its back on Israel in its darkest time of need since its creation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, in the call, uh, President Biden asked Benjamin Netanyahu for an immediate ceasefire and also talked about protecting um, aid workers. Tragically, seven were killed uh, just a few days ago. Uh, what does this mean for Israel? What, what kind of position does this put Israel in? It puts Israel in an absolutely impossible position. If Biden continues down this path, it becomes a genuinely existential threat to Israel. This is, you know, Israel is now waging war, and to this day, even using the ridiculous numbers put forth by Hamas in terms of numbers of dead, Israel is waging a war with fewer civilian casualties than any war that we've ever recorded in history. It's extraordinary, in a very difficult circumstance, in a very crowded area. And by the way, part of the reason it's crowded, Chris, is because America is insisting on keeping those Arabs in place in a war zone, as opposed to what we do around the world in every other situation, which we encourage and try to implement the transfer of populations during war. America, America is complicit in boxing them in so that they can turn Israel into the bad guy. Uh, it seems a few weeks ago, uh, Senator Schumer called for uh, elections. Uh, Benny Gantz called for elections. A few weeks ago, the CIA said there, there would probably be an overthrow of the government. Is this a progression of the White House and the Biden administration trying to undermine the Netanyahu government? This is the Biden White House, as far as I can tell, and I don't want to speak for any organization here, but being here on the ground and also doing shuttle diplomacy, let's say, or being back and forth uh, to the United States and to Washington. It seems pretty clear that there was an attempt by the Biden administration to help support groups that were trying to undermine the governing coalition before October 7th. Until October 6th, as you know, there was a lot of unrest in the streets here, and we know that some of the support for that was coming out of the United States. We looked into it at ACLJ. We knew at least some of the support not only came from the United States monetarily, but even a little bit seems to have come directly from the government, and certainly indirectly money was given, and money is fungible, money was given by this administration to groups. Some of those groups have also given money to support the demonstrations here, completely targeted to destabilize the governing coalition. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for uh, the future of U.S.-Israeli relations? It's become completely binary, Chris. It's become binary. Uh, there is one party that supports the U.S.-Israel relationship for real. There's another party that still thinks it's okay to use the rhetoric saying we support but puts so many conditions on it that it becomes more extortion than support. So, for example, right now, if you look at the two parties' platforms, the Republicans say Israel's a sovereign state, it's our ally, Israel seeks peace, Israel takes risk for peace, we trust Israel, we will support what Israel wants in its own best interest. The Democrats' platform says the opposite. It says we support Israel as our ally, however, only on condition that they create, not their words, but I'll use the words, a terror state, right, a jihadi terror state in Judea and Samaria. So that's not actually support, that's extortion. If they wanted Israel to survive, if they trusted Israel as a sovereign ally, then they would let Israel make decisions about peace and be supportive. What position does this put Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu in? Uh, they want to go into Rafah, finally defeat Hamas. Where does this put Israel and the Prime Minister? Israel is between a rock and a hard place. I mean, you could look at the political realities here as well. Everyone here knows this is existential, that Israel has literally zero choice but to go in. And yet they're working, and yet we have an American administration working as hard as it can to demonize Benjamin Netanyahu and to undermine and break this coalition. The truth is, Chris, it's impossible to conceive of a coalition that will not have to go into Rafah at some point or a situation in which Israel continues to live under the threat of more and more October 7th. Yeah, Jeff Balaban, thanks for your insight and analysis. Thank you, Chris. Coming up, new revelations about efforts by the White House to affect Israeli policy and elections. As the bureau chief for Jew Jews Jewish News Syndicate, Alex Trayman has a front row seat on the changing dynamic between the U.S. and Israel. We caught up with him recently to hear his thoughts on this week's events. Alex Treman, thanks for joining us. Uh, Benny Gantz is calling for new elections. What's your reaction? 
Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, I think that this is the end of the political unity that we saw here in Israel for six months. Remember, we had uh, long periods of divisiveness uh, due to five elections in five years uh, here in Israel. And, and yet, when October 7th occurred, most of the nation understood that they needed to unify in order to uh, successfully wage the war uh, inside Gaza and potentially also against Lebanon. Uh, but now, as the war has dragged on and as pressure between the U.S. and Israel has uh, continued to intensify. We're seeing that uh, Benny Gantz and some of his political allies that joined the National Unity Government have run out of patience. And once again, the divisions that uh, precluded October 7th are seemingly resurfacing. They're calling for new elections, but what do most Israelis want? I think most Israelis want unity. Their sons and daughters and brothers and sisters are fighting inside Gaza. Uh, I think Israelis understand that it was the political divisiveness that sent a strong message to Israel's uh, enemies that uh, the Jewish state was vulnerable to an attack. Uh, and as long as the war continues to, to wage inside Gaza and as long as a looming war with Hezbollah, uh, which has fired over 2,000 missiles and, and drones and, uh, and mortars at Israel since October 7th, Seventh, that continues to remain a potent threat. I think that Israelis would prefer to stay united and wait until the dust settles in order to have accountability for October 7th and go to another election. Yeah. Is this uh, coordinated with the White House? Oh, this is absolutely coordinated with the White House. Uh, Benny Gantz traveled to the White House uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, that was a trip that was explicitly not approved by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and and because Netanyahu obviously understood what was at stake with this trip, uh, Gantz decided to go anyways. Uh, in addition to meeting with Kamala Harris, he also met with Chuck Schumer. Just a week after he met with Schumer, Schumer called for a new election in Israel from the floor of the Senate. Uh, at the time, Gantz said, that uh, foreigners shouldn't be the ones deciding when there'd be elections in Israel. And yet, uh, less than two weeks later, Gantz himself calls for an election, and Schumer congratulates him. Uh, so, yes, I, I do believe it, it, that the White House has made it very, very clear that they want Netanyahu out of office, and they've also made clear that Benny Gantz is their preferred candidate, uh, most probably because Netanyahu has been the one standing uh, in the way of the creation of a Palestinian state, while Benny Gantz, uh, when he was defense minister in, in 2022, actually invited invited Mahmoud Abbas, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, to his house inside Israel. Uh, so they think that Gantz would be the one that would accommodate the American desire to see a two-state solution. Uh, your colleague there at JNS, uh, Carolyn Glick, talked about a four-point plot to overthrow the government. Uh, what's your reaction to her analysis? Well, I think that if you see the moves that the United States are taking, uh, you can understand that, A, they continue to press Israel for uh, the issue of humanitarian aid. Uh, Carolyn Glick reports that uh, ministers in the government are being threatened, uh, that they could be uh, convicted of war crimes uh, for what's going on in Gaza. And, and so they are uh, trying to take control uh, of the war effort in Gaza. They've clearly been trying to slow down the war effort by uh, prohibiting Israel from going into Rafah, which is the last major stronghold of Hamas inside the Gaza Strip. They've been gaslighting Netanyahu constantly through the press, uh, and they've been now uh, working with protest movements to, to restart protests inside Israel. So, yes, absolutely a coordinated effort. The White House is being very, very clear about who they want to be the prime minister of Israel and who they don't, uh, which is Quite, uh, quite odd for the United States to be so openly uh, pressing a Democratic ally that has once again had five elections in the last five years uh, to, to go to an election while it is in the middle of conducting a war. Yeah, and finally, I, Alex, uh, you talked earlier on, uh, on one of your channels there at JNS about uh, the U.S. having a three-point plan in Rafah. What's that plan? Well, what they first want to do is to prevent Israel from launching a large-scale operation inside Rafah. What they prefer is that uh, Israel simply encircle Rafah to basically put a perimeter around it and, and around the million or so Gazans that are currently holed up in Rafah in a tent city, uh, many of them were residents of northern and central Gaza, uh, and only to go inside Rafah, inside targeted operations where there's uh, specific intelligence about where there might be terrorist leaders. Uh, and 
And to accomplish that goal, uh, the United States is, is asking Israel to have a, a joint command and control center uh, on that operation, which essentially would enable the United States to have a veto over what Israel does. So, so clearly, between that and the port that the United States is now demanding uh, off the coast of Gaza, the United States is trying to gain control over Israel's autonomy to operate inside the Gaza Strip as it chooses. Well, quite a, quite a tumultuous time. Very controversial, very critical time. Appreciate, Alex, your analysis and expertise. Thanks so much, Chris. Up next, traveling around the world on their own dime to help Israeli farmers bring in the crops. Israeli farmers have especially felt the impact of October 7th. While locals have jumped in to help, it's not been enough. As CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us, some American farmers have stepped up to bring needed skills to the fields. Here on Moshav Dekel near Gaza, war prevented farmers from harvesting this eggplant crop. They should have been harvested in you know, end of November, December, and there was no workers. So, you know, in a very literal sense, the, the, in Israel, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. We didn't have uh, water for our crops. And in uh, October, it was very hot here. And then after the water came back, the workers leave. We used to have uh, uh, foreign workers mm -hmm. from Thailand. That's when author Doug Hershey stepped in to help by arranging trips for farmers to come here. I have a company called Ezra Adventures that is a travel company for small groups. But in Hebrew, Ezra or Ezra means help. When you have specific skills from the states that connect with specific needs in Israel and to be able to blend those, it's really been amazing. Aner Agiv, a farmer here, is also head of security. It's incredible that uh, guys from another country decide to come here with, uh, on their own money and on their own spare time. They're also farmers as, as us. It's beautiful. These volunteers behind me are picking strawberries less than two miles from the Gaza border. If they weren't here helping out, these strawberries wouldn't likely go to market. We heard that there was a big need uh, in this area since a lot of the farmers were called into the reserves and military that a lot of the crops were going unharvested. This is Katie Scherzer's first time in Israel. Picking strawberries at home, we would be picking them down on the ground and not up in the air. So this is very cool to see. Uh, the people here are fantastic. Even though they're going through war right now, they're so giving at the same time. Kelly Zimmerman, another first timer, says she came to link arms and give support. I think there's no better way than to show up in person. And we've experienced that. It means a lot to people here. And um, so it's been a beautiful thing so far. But you came during a war, were you afraid? Uh, no. I love adventure. What are you going to tell people when you go home? Come to Israel. Experience it for yourself. Bella, who owns the strawberry greenhouses, says without volunteers, she wouldn't have had a crop or income. The volunteers did so much. I don't have enough words to thank them for what they did. Danny, whose identity is hidden for security reasons, says for the last six months, this area has felt frozen in time, but the volunteers are helping bring it back to life. So what do you think about these volunteers? That Oof, it's amazing. It's amazing. After the 7th of October, you know, after the few months, it's, it's, it's hard for us to, to push. And these people come, you know, with big heart to help us, you know. Pennsylvania farmers John Kreider and Jim Scherzer are helping Danny. We're all farmers. We are. We love working hard. We love the agriculture. We love working with farmers. The the whole atmosphere. So, it's a, just a chance to serve at what what we're good at. This morning we were cutting down trees uh, that are around a uh, water source that he is going to be using for expansion of his fields. And their message when they go home. Just that they're they're good people. They've suffered a lot but they're resilient and they're, they're forging ahead, but, but they needed help. It's a great country. Um, not to be cliche, but it's flowing with milk and honey. It's amazing to see green fields in the middle of the desert. Hershey says they're stepping into the pages of the Bible to fulfill prophecy. 
Isaiah 61 talks about strangers and foreigners coming to, to help, but not just help, working in the fields, tending the fields, tending the vineyards, and that's exactly what we've been doing. He encourages others to step up and help. There are tremendous needs here in this land. Israel is heartbroken. They are still grieving the losses of friends. They're still trying to figure out families that are scattered all over the place. This is the time to support Israel. You can support by prayer. You can support by financially giving. And there are opportunities, whether it's with groups with, with mine, with Ezra Adventures or other opportunities, there are opportunities to, to come and help, to actually be involved. He says it also honors the covenant God made with the Jewish people forever. For Christians, if they've enjoyed their Jewish Bible and their Jewish Messiah, they've enjoyed the spiritual blessings of Israel and Christians owe a debt according to Romans 15. And the way you repay that debt is to minister to Israel and to serve Israel with material needs. If there's ever been a time to do that, it's right now. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Moshav Dekel, Southern Israel. If your church or small group would like to get involved with Project in Israel, you can get more information at EzraAdventures.com. Come to Israel and get involved practically. You'll be blessed for blessing the apple of God's eye. Still ahead, putting down roots in a new land. See how CBN partners are helping immigrants get on their feet in Israel. Welcoming new Israelis is part of the Jewish Agency's mission, and CBN partners are supporting that multifaceted process. A big part of it involves learning the language and culture at an Olpan, a language school. Part of the solution to recover from the atrocities of October 7th is Aliyah having more young adults with energy, with passion, with education to come and build up in the land. CBN have been helping tremendously, telling the story of Israel, telling the reality of what's happening on the ground, fighting bigotry, fighting anti-Semitism, and being able to tell the truth from Israel. Every Aliyah into Israel is challenging. It's a long, hard process. Now, when they're coming from a situation of war. Integration is that much more difficult. We're dealing here with about 250 lone young adults that have come to Israel to start a new life. They live here in dorm settings and they study an intensive course so that they can acquire a level of Hebrew that's sufficient to get either into the job market or into higher education. We have here a staff that works 24-7 to mentor them, to support them in every need they have, whether it's emotional or practical, we want to help guide them in their next steps in Israel so they can make a solid network of friends. They come alone, they leave as a community. There are difficulties for new arrivals because they worry about the country they left behind, but at the same time uh, there's a relief because they found a new place to settle in and here they have a new future. When the war just broke out here, immigrants heading to uh, Israel didn't know how to react, but now we see that uh, they still want to come and uh, we also expect more immigrants after the war ends. There will be a new wave of immigration. We don't just teach our students, but offer a, a psychological support at least twice a month during their program. Toward the end of their stay with us, we also plug them into a social support program. The support that CBN gives the Jewish Agency is hugely important, and we see it in all different areas of our work. CBN was doing this work before the war started, and now they are helping these immigrants who need a chance, need an opportunity to get a good start in their new country and to go into a life of meaning and purpose. And beyond that, of course, the work that CBN is doing to support Aliyah, whether it's from Ethiopia, Ukraine, Russia, and this is so important for the future, not just of the individuals that CBN touches through the Jewish Agency, but overall for Israel. If you want to be a part of what CBN is doing in Israel, go to cbnisrael.org and see how you can participate. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. You can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. Please continue to pray for IDF soldiers, for those caught in harm's way, and for the return of all the hostages. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.